Hey, my mic is muted. What's up? That was a lame-ass transition. Actually, probably the lamest transition I could have come up with. Um. Hey, guys. How's the music volume? How's everything? I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing in the slightest. Or should I put my camera in shit? Who knows? What's up, Soph? Hi, Avian. Hi, Gots. Alright, fuck it. We'll move it down here so you guys can actually see the words. Alright. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is lump suckers and salmon farming. Uh, and then we're going to talk about sharks. I was going to do sharks first. But honestly, I'm just really fucking excited to talk about this cute ass fish. This video is going to be called How the Cutest Boy in the Fish World Revolutionized Aquaculture or something stupid like that. Basically, this dumbass little looking cute fish revolutionized uh, how we raise salmon. It's pretty hype. Hi, Nat. Okay. You guys ready? I'm not. <laughs> like a fucking classroom. Stop being so mean. I'm sorry. I love lump suckers. They're a little dumb. I'll show you a video. They're a little dumb. Yes, everyone get your notepads out. Peep OG. Okay. So, we're going to talk about lump suckers in aquaculture. If you don't know what lump suckers are, they're this little fish that's on your screen right now. Uh, they look like lumps, and then they have suckers on the bottom of their body that allow them to attach to things. Think of like the remoras that hang on sharks, they have that. And you can see one attaching to this dude's face right here. They have very cute faces. They're very small. Uh, you know, cool fish. And you might think, okay, well, this is a, a weird fish to be, it's called a lump sucker. So if, you might be thinking this is a weird fish to talk about, right? What's so interesting about this weird little thing? It looks like sort of like a stone fish or something like that, but just a little bit cuter. A lump sucker. Are you guys happy? Can I say lump sucker more often? But there's something very, very, very important about lump suckers. Now, if you guys don't know, <laughs> why is it called lump suckers? Because I just explained that. They have suckers on their belly and they look like lumps. They don't suck lumps. <laughs> okay, I gotta not pay too much attention to chat because I'm gonna totally lose my train of thought. But feel free to ask... No, I'm not saying lump again. Actually, I just said it. There you go. Feel free to ask questions. I'll answer if it's relevant. Anyways, I feel like over-presenting, but I think I have enough information to present in the thing that I can skip over-presenting. Basically, we're going to talk about how salmon farming, which is the process of raising salmon in fish systems uh, and aquaculture systems for food, has been totally revolutionized and redone uh, with the use of this little fish, the lump sucker. Uh, very cute and very, very useful. So, part one, the problem. First of all, why the fuck do we need that in the first place? Well, let's talk a little bit about aquaculture. So, if you see by these pictures, what you'll notice is there's a lot of fucking fish. Like, way too many fish just overlapping each other. Uh, and this is somewhat common in aquaculture nowadays. So, it used to be in aquaculture that in order for fish to not be stressed, because if they're stressed, they don't grow as much. So, you want to keep your fish not stressed. In order for them to not be stressed, you wanted to, you know, feed them enough. You needed the water to be good quality. They needed to have plenty of room. Um, you needed to limit stress response as much as possible. Right? But because of modern technology and the fact that we are so, so good at regulating water quality and aquaculture farms, it's no longer that big of a deal to overstock. Basically, we can put a shitload of fish in a small container and with the magic of chemicals and various things like that we can create these environments where there are a ton of fish in a very small space 
without having to worry about diminishing the water quality to the point where it's, you know, no longer acceptable for the fish. Everything can still function well. This is obviously examples of a little bit overage, but it's, uh, the, the general idea is that recently we've gotten more and more into overstocking fisheries and that the general idea to take away from that is that fish are stored really close together they're raised really close together and that becomes a problem when you have parasites in aquaculture so there's this little thing called the water louse or water lice and basically what it does is it attaches on the fish it's parasitic uh it consumes basically their flesh uh, and has pretty detrimental effects on the fish, as you can see by the salmon on the right, if left unkept. And the problem with parasites is you really can't avoid parasites ending up in aquaculture systems. No matter how well you sterilized, no matter how well you, you know, you know how, how limiting you are, you can quarantine fish when they come into the system. Parasites will find their way in. They might be on a fish that you release into the system. They might somehow get in through water transport. Uh, it's basically impossible to avoid parasites ending up in your aquaculture system. And this particular parasite is called the water lice. And for a really long time, we had a really big problem because they love salmon, right? And these environments that we just talked about, where the fish are really, really close, makes it really, really easy for parasites. Are they only harmful to fish or they affect humans as well when consumed? Well, I'll tell you one thing, Avian. No one wants to eat that salmon. Would you buy this salmon at the grocery store? Whether the lice was on it or not, there'd be lesions like this, the red blood spot everywhere. No one wants to eat that. Is it necessarily bad for you? No. It's not necessarily bad for you. But it's uh, it's not good for you. <laughs> Uh, and people don't want to buy it anyways. And not not to mention the, the water lice consuming the flesh is actually uh, lowering their lifespan and limiting their growth. So even if they were, you know, even if it had absolutely no health effects on the people eating them, the problem is the fish won't grow as much. So it's just all around a huge problem for aquaculture and you can't avoid parasites getting in. So what you want is to prevent the parasites from causing any damage in the system once they're in the system. And there's a quote from Natural History Museum, basically just talking about how sea lice are literally affecting all salmon farms. Uh, it's been a huge issue for a really long time, okay? Now we're going to talk about how we used to solve it, because obviously this issue hasn't existed for as many years as we've been, you know, farming salmon without having some kind of solution. Uh, and basically, what we use is pesticides, or what we've always used is pesticides. Uh, pesticides will... At the right amounts, fish are larger, fish are hardier than the smaller parasites. They can take more, you know, chemical overdose than parasites can. So you put enough chemicals to where it doesn't kill the fish, but it does kill the parasites. Uh, and obviously that has some pretty harmful effects. If you're raising fish in wild environments, uh, I mean, the, the, the pesticides are just straight up going out of the net and affected the nearby environment, which is a lot of the times when they do aquaculture on the ocean, they'll just set up a net in the ocean and put the fish in it. Yeah, chemicals bad. Uh, people don't want to eat pesticides. That's a, that's a problem. Who the fuck wants to buy a fish that was, you know, given enough pesticides? But don't worry, it wasn't enough to kill it, just enough to kill the things on it. Um, and this is basically how we deal with this problem, because there's no other way to deal with the parasites that we'd come up with. Opinion on pesticides? Uh, in some cases, they get a bad rep, but definitely overall very negative. Uh, you definitely don't want to be consuming pesticides. But I think it is definitely a buzzword that people use for like bad in aquaculture in any kind of thing. There are some cases where utilizing pesticides is the best solution. There are some cases where it's not harmful to anybody and, you know, closed systems. Um, you know. What do pesticides taste like? Probably, have you ever licked a battery? Go lick a battery. Don't do that. Don't lick a battery. But imagine what it would be like to lick a battery. That's pesticides. Anyways. <laughs> pesticides <laughs> basically been released uh, into these farms, which causes harm to the fish. 
uh, the consumer doesn't want to eat it, and if they're raised in wild systems, it causes harm to nearby areas. Not to mention, even if you're in a closed system, aquaculture systems don't usually use the same water, even in recirculating aquaponic systems. So, you know, even in the ideal system where the fish water that you're using is just continuously being filtered, some of it is becoming wastewater. You can't recycle all of the water, okay? So what you have to do is put some of it as wastewater. That means it goes into the local stream, uh, it goes into a drainage, a wastewater management facility, uh, and that water is going to be filled with pesticides when you're using it that way. So it's not a great solution all around, but if you have a problem of parasites that are killing all of your fish, you gotta do what you gotta do, right? Like, what the fuck are you gonna do? So there's a huge problem, like I just brought up, with pesticides, and that is people don't want to eat pesticides. Even if you don't want to, you know, talk about the fact that uh, they're harmful for the fish, they're harmful for the environment, uh, they're harmful for the drinking water of people nearby these fish farms, even if you want to ignore all of those negatives, no one wants to eat a fish that is covered in pesticides. So these are just examples of, uh, you know, crackdowns, boycotts, stuff like that on supermarket chains and fish farms that were using pesticides on their fish. Uh, I'm going to be real with you guys. If it doesn't say pesticide free on your food, it, it, people are using pesticides, right? But then people realize they get upset. They freak out, right? So people, this is, that's basically what happened. Someone wrote a news story. Everybody freaked out. They've been eating pesticides for decades. News story. Everybody freaks out. And for good reason, you don't want pesticides in your food, especially not at that level, especially not unchecked. More than anything, you do not want pesticides unchecked, okay? Pesticides in limited amounts for the right purposes to make the farm more efficient can be very, very good. However, when aquaculture facilities are not held accountable for the amount of pesticides that they are dumping into the you know local drinking water and the amount of pesticides that are building up in their fish, that's a problem, okay? So... In comes the cutest of boys. And you might be thinking, this isn't a lump sucker. You're right, this is a wrasse. And this is one of our recent solutions uh, to salmon farming and to water lice and water louse. Because there's this thing called wrasse or cleaner wrasse, and their whole specialty is eating the parasites off of other fish. Uh, it's W-R-A-S-S-E. They have uh, symbiotic relationships with a lot of other animals like sharks, uh, where the shark will say, hey, I won't eat you, just eat the shit off my back, and we'll leave each other alone. And so the sharks come in and they stop. The wrasse, you know, give them a little sucky sucky. The sharks go off to do their business, and uh, very helpful. So for a while, we were using these uh, these wrasse in farms, because wrasse were able to do the thing that we needed. They were able to, without the use of pesticides, take away the parasites <laughs> from uh from the salmon in the farms and it served as a great solution until we realized something boom it's winter and let me tell you about something about wrasse they're generally a reef fish and reef fish don't like the winter not in uh you know northern climates and so all these farms that are utilizing these wrasse to clean the salmon and they're like oh yeah great we don't have to deal with pesticides anymore we have wrasse to, to clean off our fish now and then the winter came and all the wrasse died <laughs> or they realized if they were intelligent enough we need to keep the water warm and then they have to use one of these and this is called a heater this is a water heater and let me tell you what running a water heater for a small pond for a singular tank not that much electricity not that expensive, you know, initial cost for the heaters. Running a water heater for an entire aquaculture system will cost you more than the actual amount that you will make by raising the fish. There is essentially no sustainable way to heat that large amount of water unless you live in a climate like Hawaii or something like that where the water's warm, you know, all times of year. Lucky, lucky for the, you know, the aquaculture farmers, you don't actually need warm water for salmon. Salmon don't care. Salmon are, are willing to live in cold water. This is, you can see dead of winter, snow in the background. This dude just caught a fucking salmon. It's probably 10 degrees in that water. Because you can do that. Salmon don't care. Unfortunately, wrasse do. Wrasse do care and they die in the winter. So the logical next step is to find a fish that can serve the same purpose as wrasse 
eating the sea lice without dying in the winter. And that is where our best friend comes in. The lump sucker. This is the intake of a single lump sucker in an aquaculture system. My head's blocking some of it, but these are sea lice. Each one of these is one of the parasites that they're trying to get rid of. Here's a lump sucker sucking off the back of a trout. Here's a bunch of cute ones looking at you. Yep. Okay. Everyone's... Fr I thought you were going to think it was cute. Why is everybody freaking out? Why is everybody disgusted? I thought you were going to... Well, it... Okay, everyone's freaking... Well, no, it was supposed to be... You were supposed to like this. Oh, you don't like the lice. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, no, yeah, lice are gross. And that is why the cutest of cute boys has shown up. And he has eaten all of these lice for us. He got rid of them from all of the salmon in the farm. Say thank you, Mr. Lumpsucker. <laughs> and now we have a solution that has been going for a couple of years now. <laughs> now we have a solution that has been going for a couple of years now. We have a fish that we can keep in the aquaculture system, be completely sustained on the things that on the lice that it's eating in the aquaculture system, as long as there are lice present. Uh, they can do complete cleanses of the aquaculture system. It doesn't really cost anything extra because you don't have to heat the system. You don't need increased filtration. They're not picky at all. And uh, yeah, that is pretty much the general idea. They have uh, revolutionized salmon farming. Salmon farming and salmon in general have become significantly cheaper as a result of the fact that we no longer use, need to use a shitload of pesticides and healthier as well. We no longer need to sustain RAS if you don't want to use pesticides, which is never sustainable. We just throw one of these cute little guys in there, make sure they're fed and happy, and uh, they'll do the job for us. Pretty cool. Uh, and just to end off, we'll look at a video of some cute lump suckers because, you know, I fucking love them. Look at that lump sucker's sucking on the other lump sucker. He's riding him. These are a bunch of them probably getting ready to go into an aquaculture system. Adorable. <laughs> Suckception lump tower. Are they mating? Wow, so many things being thrown at me. No, I didn't break the button. No, they're not mating. They're not looking at you like anything that's just their face. Suckception is funny. Lump Tower is funny. Okay. That is my presentation. How much lump suckers would need for about 100 salmon? Because wouldn't they eventually finish off the lice and compete for each other? Do they also eat what the salmon get fed? They also eat what the salmon get fed. Or, in some cases, if you want to be more efficient about it, they have their own separate food system. But oftentimes what's done is cleanses. The lump fish, uh, the lump suckers aren't consistently in uh, aren't consistently in the uh, the system, what'll happen is they'll release them into the system if there's a water lice infestation, give them like, you know, a week, think of it like a, a detox, except detox don't actually work, but lump suckers do work, uh, and then take them out of the system. So they're in the system for a little bit, they solve the problem, then they get out of the system once it's pretty clear that there's, you know, no more water lice population affecting the salmon. I'm not answering that. I've seen Seaman from Dreamcast Melody. Not a fan. I was called funny on the internet. Day improved. Same, man. All right, are there any other lump sucker questions before we move on to the second presentation? That was a pretty quick one. They're both going to be pretty quick. What did you ask, Soph? What does lump suckers like to eat? Well, parasites. All kinds of stuff. They're not very... I mean, their name is Lump Sucker. They're not exactly the most picky as far as food goes. They're not specifically cleaner fish. They don't always, you know, have to rely on sucking parasites off of other fish. Can I squish them? Will they explode? Depends how much you squish them, I suppose. How big are they? Sure. I can do that. Lump Sucker... Comparison. No, bigger than a quarter. I'm sure we could find a good thing online. Um... <laughs> the fuck is this? Uh... 
Okay, I can't find a good... Okay, it would fit in the palm of my hand. It would easily fit in the palm of my hand. Does it have a vertebra? All fish have vertebra. Animal. Kingdom. Phylum. Chordata. The word chordata, chordate, meaning spinal cord, starts here. Includes fish, humans, all that crap. How do they reproduce? It's a great question. I don't know a ton about it. Can they roll on land? I don't know. Lump sucker on land. I feel like this is not going to warrant the results that I'm looking for. I don't know. They split in half over and over. Yeah, they work like viral cells, actually. They work like bacteria. They reproduce exactly like bacteria. They just split in half. It's pretty cool. Yeah, meiosis, for sure. Do they have brains? Yes. Pretty much everything has a brain. What's up, Calamity? Do they have thoughts? <laughs> That's a fucking rough question. Um, I'm under the impression from what I know that all fish have thoughts. Not all fish, actually. But most fish have some kind of thought. But how you define a thought and shit is weird. How do jellyfish function without brains? They are... Jellyfish are literally a, just a fucking, like, chain of chemicals, right? So, like, you know how in, like a, a, like, a chemistry reaction, you have, like, a chain of, like, amino acids or some shit like that, and it'll always react to something? Jellyfish are just a really big chain of chemicals. How do fishes communicate? What do you mean by communicate? Fishes have this thing called the lateral line on the side of their body. Uh, you've probably seen it. You didn't realize. Like, if you pick any fish, it's not, not always this discernible, but you can see it. It's basically a series of pores uh, on the side of their body, and they can sense pressure changes in the water using those pores. Uh, so basically, you know how there's, like, really large schools of fish? Have you ever seen really large schools of fish? And, like, how do they know how to move together? How are they not running into each other and stuff? They basically, they have this thing called the lateral line, which is hypersensitive to, to changes in water pressure and movement, and they can sense things around them based on that. Uh, if you mean actually, actually communicate, as in sending messages, different species have different ways of doing it. There are gobies that just, like, have different, uh, different signals for different, like, things that they want their partner to do, which is pretty cool. Um... No, your body can't house a lump sucker. No, you can't tickle. Can they feel emotions? I don't fucking know, man. That's that's a talk for another time. There's too much to there's too much to talk about. There's like one person in the entire world who I would think could give a legitimate incredible talk on fish emotion and thinking. And that's Lynn Snedden, who is a friend of mine. But um I don't think she'd be down to come on a Twitch stream. So, sorry, guys. <laughs> Predatory... Okay. If they went extinct, what would happen? Uh, the same thing that would happen in essentially any ecosystem when a species goes extinct. Um, if it's a keystone species, the ecosystem collapses. I doubt lump suckers are a keystone species. Um, but the, the ecosystem would become severely imbalanced. It could be totally disrupted, uh, or it could adjust. Ecosystems are wild like that. We never know what will happen, and that's why we try not to make species go extinct. Because sometimes a species that doesn't really seem very important goes extinct, and you realize it had this crazy function, and now that entire ecosystem falls the fuck apart. So that's why you gotta be really careful about not letting things go endangered. Even if- or go, go extinct. Even if you think- that it doesn't matter because you don't think that their function matters that much to their ecosystem it probably matters more than you realize and then sometimes there's species that seem really important and then their presence is diminished in the ecosystem and nothing changes it's we're really bad at predicting that kind of thing well they don't really have lumps they kind of just look like a lump would they fly in the wind no definitely too heavy it's the lump sucker population lump sucker population i don't think they're endangered 
Cyclopteridae, huh? The funny ass name. Um, there are 30 species. Mm -hmm. Could I eat them? You can eat anything. Yeah, they're not listed as an endangered species or anything, so they're good. What would one smell like? I don't know. I don't think they're poisonous. Though, they do look a lot like uh, stonefish. They look a lot like this guy. Stonefish. And he's very poisonous. <laughs> you can step on him and instantly die. I think it's the most venomous fish in the world. <laughs> so, if you're going to hang out with a lump sucker, try to make sure that it's actually a lump sucker and not a stonefish. It's my, my uncle. Hmm. Can I? Are there prehistoric lump suckers? Um, let's see. Cyclop... Turidae evolution date. Uh, I've never heard the term, term stargazer, but maybe. Here, let's look at a Springer article on the phylogeny. Oh, it's just the abstract, isn't it? Rip. Never mind. I was going to try and see when that, that whole genus evolved, but we don't know. Um, Is it also called a stargazer? Let's see. Okay, that's not what I'm looking for. No, that is a different fish. That is not a lump sucker. Totally different thing. Those are called stargazers because they lay on the bottom <laughs> and look up. But uh, yeah, no, not the same fish. <laughs> Though with those wonky ass cross eyes, I don't think that they're actually seeing any stars. But would you kiss it? No, probably not. Favorite fish of the anglerfish? Pog you. Anglerfish are pretty cool. Do you know that the male anglerfish is significantly smaller? If a female anglerfish is like this, the male is like this. Like this. And when he finds his female, he bites onto her ovaries, a fish equivalent of ovaries, and then just serves as, serves as a uh, sperm sac for the rest of his life. Never has a mouth again, never swims on his own again. That is hot. Thank you, Joa. How does a fish pee? It just does. There's no active mechanic for peeing as a fish. It just happens. Water is intake. It's filtered. And it comes out. Football fish? I think I've heard of it, but I don't actually know what it is. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Lantern angler fish type shit. I really want to explode a fish. How would I go around doing that? Okay, so what you're going to want to do is check into your local mental hospital and never go near a fish again. How big is a lump sucker's lump? Man, I don't I don't really think they have lumps. I think that's just the name because they look like they're a lump on something. Like if you saw this attached to the side of something, you'd think it's a lump. It's a lump on the dude's head. What if the fish deserved it? What could a fish possibly do to deserve that? Nair. How is a lump sucker's day? Well, I imagine they go around and they eat and they shid and they pee. Are you happy? Is that what you wanted? Yeah, I don't fucking know. Ask one yourself. Your questions are getting off track. I'll give you a couple more questions if they're not relevant and then I'll move on to the shark presentation. <laughs> the American dream. Fish don't have penises, Red Lobster. Why did you become a fish person? What did fish ever do for you? Uh, I like animals in general a lot, and fish are the most underrepresented by far. Fish are being overfished. Um, they're losing, you know, population due to habitat loss. That lots of fish are going extinct. Lots of fish we don't even know anything about, and uh, no one really gives a shit. <laughs> so someone has to. Plus, I just really like fish. Yeah, underwater life is really cool. Will you watch those videos I recommended you in the comments on stream? Sure. You can link them here, Roden. I'm going to do one more presentation on sharks for another video, and then if you want me to watch something, you guys can link me. Good night, Red Lobster. <clears throat> do baby lump suckers suck smaller parasites than the adults? It's a good question. Generally, in the animal kingdom... Babies tend to eat smaller and 
oftentimes different, entirely different food uh, than adults. But stuff like water lice, parasites are pretty small, so I don't know. Um, no, Nat, probably not. I probably wouldn't want to be a fish. They're treated pretty shittily by humans. Even if you have an ideal life far away from humans, seems kind of lame. There's some fish that do some cool shit, but it's cool shit to humans, you know? To them, it wouldn't be cool shit, because it's just what they do every day. How do I link the videos? Um, just copy and paste it into the chat if you want. Someone will save it until I'm done. Why be a fish if you can study fish? True. Where are lump suckers usually found? Great question. I'm pretty sure in colder climates. Arctic, North Atlantic, and North Pacific. Yep. All the cold places. Basically the top of the earth. Thrasher sharks are... Wait, do you mean thrasher shark or trasher shark? I don't know what a trasher shark is. I know what a thrasher shark is. I wouldn't trade being a human for any other species. I don't know about that. Like a really intelligent bird seems hype. It's a globe, Zach. There isn't a top. There's a top slice. Like you could slice the top off of it, the earth, you know? Imagine you slice the top off of the earth. That is the ecosystem of the lump sucker. Okay. All right. You guys want to learn about why sharks aren't dangerous? How's the music volume and everything, by the way? Yeah, thresher sharks are pretty hype. <clears throat> this is going to be a long one. There's going to be a rant. There's going to be multiple rants. I need to ignore you guys a little bit to make my points, okay? But say what you want to say. And if it's relevant enough, I will uh, talk about it. You got nightmares from Jaws? Perfect. We're going to talk about that. Hi, Soph. What's that shark called on the right? No clue. No fucking clue. Sure, you could look up cute shark and find it. It's really hard to... <laughs> Maybe Joseph, yeah, yeah. It's hard to tell fish from the front or from, like, the top. Any of those angles. This is, like, the ideal angle, because you can see all of the various fins. Never saw Jaws because I'm a zoomer. And yet, Calamity, whether you saw it or not, I guarantee you, your entire mindset on sharks has been shaped by the impact that it's left on society you think it's an angel shark i don't think so but i don't know i don't know sharks very well sharks do not equal scary bad okay let's begin sharks are not monsters so you need to have an open mind here all right to go into this presentation because what we're trying to undo is decades i mean almost half a century of misinformation, uh, of over-dramatization, uh, and of just straight-up lying, okay? And these things, you might not even realize, are deeply, deeply embedded in you because of the media you've consumed and you've been, you know, raised upon. So you just gotta just, just be open for a little bit. Listen to some stuff. Some of you probably already are shark woke. Maybe you already know that sharks actually aren't that bad. But a lot of people still think sharks are pretty fucking awful. So it's time for people to learn. So let us start. So the first thing we need to do is talk about why you think they are monsters. Because a lot, a lot, a lot of people think that sharks are monsters. And it's important to examine why you think they are. So this is the basic reason. This is the non-important reason. But it's the foundation. Because if you want to... If you want to make a society fear something, if you want to make an entire large group of people fear something, it is really hard to do that. <laughs> it is really hard to do that without there being some kind of logical basis behind it. There needs to be a reason to fear the thing in the first place, okay? So this is just the basic biological reasons. First of all, humans hate losing control. We want to be in control of everything. The water is not your domain. Second of all, yeah, sharks look scary, obviously. And hearing about shark attacks happening doesn't help. Uh, and third of all, we're, we're not that far from our ancestors, you know? Like nowadays, the average person might not have to worry 
uh, you know, about apex predators. Like you're not running into lions or sharks or grizzly bears on a daily basis. But it's still important that we have that natural instinct for survival. So you have these things ingrained in you. But these things alone are not the reason that all of you hate sharks. They are not the reason that all of you are afraid of sharks. Because the reality is, the exact same reasons, the loss of control, the, the fear of, you know, large teeth, powerful thing, and the fear of a predator in general, apply to a grizzly bear. To this dude right here. And I guarantee you, almost no one in society is anywhere close to as scared of grizzly bears as they are to sharks. And that's crazy, because grizzly bears are fucking everywhere. And sharks are, you have to go to and then into the ocean to encounter a shark. Grizzly bears are just wandering around your neighborhoods, okay? Ugh. So you have to think about that. Why is that? Why do two predators that are essentially the same thing, actually one should be way, way more, more scary than the other. Fuck you, Calamity. Why is there such an imbalance? Why does society as a whole fear and demonize sharks? Uh, and grizzly bears, are, no one really gives a shit, generally. I mean, like, you hear stuff about grizzly bears killing people, but, like, people don't really give a shit most of the time. Yeah, bears are considered soft and cuddly. Have you ever heard, like, a childhood tear tale about, like, a cool shark? It's fucking cool bears. Even in Nemo, Bruce... Is supposed to be the cool shark, smells a drop of blood, and then tries to fucking eat them. There is no positive role model for sharks. Okay? Now, let's talk about the real reason you think they're monsters. Yeah, there's a logical foundation behind it. People are scared of predators, but that's not why is it's extreme as it is. This, this is why you're really scared. Yes, mother bears are that aggressive. This is why you're really scared of sharks, and this is why... Society as a whole is scared of sharks. Everyone knows Jaws, whether you've seen it or not. The damage it has done is literally irreparable. Uh, Shark Week, same idea. And then the vast multitude uh, of films and random movies and mockumentaries and, you know, shit like that that has been made. You know. Basically talking about how where sharks are the bad guy, where sharks are the ones that are demonized. Uh, and I don't think people realize, on a general basis, how impactful Jaws was uh, as as a movie, right? So here's something I want to, uh, an interesting little tidbit I want to tell you about. Nowadays, people think of sharks as scary. You think of sharks attacking people. Uh, you think of all sorts of all sorts of negative things when you when you think of sharks. In the early 1900s, okay, before Jaws was released. Before this kind of thing was commonplace, there was a man who had a particular interest in marine biology uh, and was very rich and put up a $10,000 bounty for anyone who could provide proof that a shark could attack a human. This is in the same century as we are, or the same century as Jaws happened, the idea of a shark attack attacking a person was so unrealistic and unbelievable that people were willing to stake the modern day equivalent of $10,000 on it. Right? Basically, it was unbelievable. It was not in the public's perception. It was not in the public's mindset. It was not something that people ever thought about. People weren't afraid of sharks. People didn't even think that a shark was capable of attacking a human or even would or had any interest. Um... And then stuff like Jaws happens. And suddenly sharks are demonized. They're made out to be this giant monster that like feeds on people, lives to use people as prey. And now we have a society which even if you live hundreds or thousands of miles from the ocean, you're still terrified of sharks. So I skipped a slide. We're going to start disproving some of the reasons that people think sharks are such bloodthirsty monsters and the first thing is this this bruce thing from nemo the shark smells a drop of blood and just goes absolutely fucking insane all right it is so 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 important that you understand how dumb this is okay this is a it's a, it's a trope and it's said a lot that sharks can smell blood from a mile away 
okay? Not only that, there's a whole ass trope that when sharks, you know, smell blood, they go crazy. They go a friend of like a feeding frenzy or something like that. Neither of those things are true. And the first thing that we need to, to talk about to explain why sharks can't smell blood from a, while, uh, a mile away is that's just not how smell works, all right? The way that smell works is when particles enter your nose or a shark's nose, basically, you know, interact with your olfactory organ. Your brain emits a signal that basically tells it what sensation that is associated with that particle. Negative sensations, positive sensations, different things smell like different things. Uh, but the most important thing to think about is that very first step. That very first step. Binary. The part where the particles enter your nose, okay? Because in order for someone or something to smell blood from a mile away, that particle needs to get from a mile away to the nose of the shark. The shark cannot smell something that can't get to it. It literally doesn't make any sense. So as an interesting example, I made a diagram. Let's say this is my grandmother and she's baking a nice pie and I'm standing right over here. I'm right next to the table, but the wind is blowing harshly in that direction. Well, here's the problem. I'm not gonna smell that pie because those particles from that pie cannot enter my nose. It is literally impossible for a particle to get here in wind heavily blowing that direction to get to this nose here. So you're not gonna smell it. So the only way, the only way that a shark can smell blood, first of all, from any distance is if the current brings it towards them. That is literally the only way that it can happen is that a current brings it towards them. It doesn't just appear out of nowhere, the particle doesn't teleport to their nose, and it doesn't go some crazy distance. But it doesn't even make sense. None of this makes sense. Okay? And just as a demonstration, we're going to watch a little bit of a Mark Rober video. Because Mark Rober did a video to test if sharks could smell a drop of blood. So let's take a quick, quick little look at Mark Rober's conclusions. I texted this demonstrate on video, but and as you can see, I'm correct on the bullet time hand spear. Even though there were tons of by placing the three boards, I prepared to push a button. Three, two, so basically what Mark Rober has done is he has set up a series of surfboards which have blood packets on them of different varieties fish human stuff like that pouring out of the surfboards uh in shark infested waters where he's recently fed sharks so there are sharks around there's going to be blood in the water and now you see how the sharks react All of them are uh, pumping and good to go. Now the clock's just ticking. We have like 55 more minutes to go. We'll see if the sharks notice it. One drop of human blood every four seconds may sound like a lot, and it certainly is. But it's also important to note that's 40 times less than the first experiment where we saw so much activity. In this case, halfway into experiment number two, even though there were tons of sharks still in the area, the boards themselves were pretty quiet. We'll have to see when we look at the footage afterwards, but so far, it, it looks like the answer is no. Five, four, three, two, one. Experiment's over. And so after the full hour, we brought in the boards and once again reviewed the footage to see that over the course of an hour, zero sharks checked out the control board, zero checked out the slow blood pumping board, and exactly zero sharks checked out the fast one. So this was by no means a perfect experiment, but I think... So, like you said, by no means a perfect experiment. It's a YouTuber, you know, making their own shit. However, it is important to note that Blood in the water does not equal frenzied shark and does not equal shark being able to get to or instantly know that there is, you know, something to get to and attack. Just an important note. All right. Now let's talk about 
the facts on attacks. I don't know why this is so fucked up. Hold on just a minute. Now they've basically demystified the whole idea of sharks. Talked about why sharks, you know, aren't actually, uh, you know, these bloodthirsty killers that they're made out to be, and why you think that they are, why you're afraid of them. Next important thing to talk about is the actual statistics on shark attacks, because you might be thinking, well, yeah, okay, you can say all of this, but sharks are have still attacked people. Uh, so it's important to to look at the statistics to basically see, you know, how legitimate that kind of thing is. So this is a chart of the U.S. deaths in 2001. 439 people died from a ladder. 322 from a bathtub. Six people died to fireworks. I have no idea how that is possible. I cannot fathom how you die to fireworks, but twice as many people died to fireworks as sharks. July 4th, that's not an explanation. How? How does July 4th go so poorly that you die to fireworks? As unreasonably stupid as that sounds, twice as many people died to that than to sharks. Because people are dumb, and clearly sharks aren't as dumb. This is my entire point. Think about how mind-lumbingly stupid you have to be to die to a firework. Okay? Now think about the fact that that happens twice as much as shark deaths. Alright? And then, talk about attacks versus fatalities. There are a decent amount of shark attacks, and by decent I mean basically fucking none, but in comparison to fatalities it seems like a lot. Right? The blue line is fatalities, purple line is attacks. In comparison to fatalities, there are a lot of attacks, meaning the vast majority of people who are attacked don't die. And if they do die, the most, 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 most important thing to keep in mind is that shark attack victims die from blood loss, okay? Because people have this perception as sharks as this bloodthirsty killer who's like hunting people down and all this dumb shit like that, they basically have the perception that the shark wants to eat you. Right? That once the shark bites you, it's going to bite you again, it sees you as a meal, it's trying to eat you, all of these things. But the reality of the situation is that when people die from shark attacks, it's blood loss. The shark bites once, realize it made a mistake, and leaves. They don't bite again because they don't want to eat you. They have no interest in eating you. Okay, These fatalities are not people being eaten. They're not being continuously you know, attacked by sharks. There are one-time attacks, which sometimes in unfortunate circumstances lead to too much blood loss for recovery. Some interesting quotes from shark scientists. A seal is a big steak with a slice of chocolate cake. A person is an old piece of celery that's been on the counter all day. Most people who are bitten by a great white get spit out and survive. They don't want to eat us. They want to eat a seal. They make mistakes just like people do. Because the reality is, they just make mistakes. It's, it's truly that simple. Uh, they're not bloodthirsty predators. They're not attacking us on purpose. Uh, you know, they're not hunting down humans. They have no intention to eat or attack people. Mistakes happen. Especially when people don't know how to deal with sharks well, which we'll talk about later. They panic. They thrash. They do stuff like that. That's just exceedingly dumb and something you should never do in a situation like that. <clears throat> Interesting note. This is the past 100 years across the world of shark attacks. <clears throat> There's about a thousand deaths. Okay? This is one nit one day one day of mosquitoes. Okay? Mosquito bites versus shark bites. Have some ever become man eaters like some tigers have? It's a good question. I don't know of a single case. Uh, where a particular shark comes back after biting someone and goes for it again. Um, you know, implying that there was there was some kind of benefit. The general, and not even just general, the majority consensus seems to be sharks bite. They spit you out because they realize they don't want you. And then they leave you alone. And it's as simple as that. They don't smell blood and go crazy. They don't attack multiple times. They have no intention to eat you. People don't get eaten by sharks. No one gets eaten by a shark. They get bit. Sometimes if the bite is forceful enough from a big enough shark. 
you could lose a limb and you could die from blood loss, but you're not getting eaten. How accurate is a shark attack in a movie Shallow to you? I've never seen the movie Shallow. Could you link me the scene in Shallow and I'll, I'll, I'll watch it maybe? And that might help me. Uh, yeah, for, if you guys have like anything you want me to, to watch, we'll do we'll do reactions and stuff after. Okay. Now, let's talk about why it's harmful. Because you might be saying, okay, yeah, sharks are misunderstood. Fine. They're not as dangerous as people think. The fear is mostly irrational. You can be with me up until this point and still think, why should I care? And the reason you should care is because sharks are going extinct uh, at an alarming rate because people are afraid of them. And it's seen oftentimes in a lot of cultures, uh, but primarily in the Western world, um, as a very, very positive thing to kill sharks. Because if you think sharks are dangerous to humans, killing sharks seems like, oh, well, I'm helping out humans. Okay? Well, this is a population chart. This is just since the 1970s. So if you don't know, the 1970s is when Jaws came out. I think it came out in 1975. In 1970, this 100% is the population of all sharks, of these different species of sharks, okay? In 1970, it's not 100% of the population. They were already suffering from overfishing and related and population loss and issues like that. But this was their population at the time. This is their population nowadays, the red, okay? 99% of poor beagle sharks since the 70s are gone. 99% of smooth hammerheads are gone. 99% of duskies, gone. 99% of bulls, gone. 97% of scallop hammerheads, gone. 97% of tigers, gone. 80% of thresher sharks. Someone in chat earlier said how much they love thresher sharks. Well, guess what? Four out of every five thresher sharks that was alive in the 70s is dead. Okay? 79% of great whites, gone. Okay? This red is the remaining population since the 70s when they were already in decline. Okay? The numbers are declining in massive amounts. And... The reason is very much primarily fear. It's why this fear is so harmful to the fish, okay? So there's an interesting quote here from a shark scientist in the Florida Museum of Natural History. Fishermen wanted to prove how brave they were. This is after Jaws was released. And with the ease of either taking a small boat onto the water or simply fishing from the shore, catching sharks as large as 500 pounds was possible with a reasonable size rod and reel. In addition to people fishing on their own, people sponsored fishing tournaments to initiate organized shark fishing for prizes, okay? People feared sharks and hunted them at an alarming rate because they feared them and because it was considered a positive thing. No one cried for a shark, you know? No one cared if you killed a shark, okay? There are fish populations people care more about, and a lot of people try to argue that overfishing is the main, the main reason, you know, that just like regular overfishing that's happening to all fish, but this species decline that you see in sharks is nowhere, nowhere near uh, the levels of, of regular fisheries decline. The decline of cod, salmon, stuff like that is very real. Those populations are heavily declining due to a variety of factors. But losing 99% of your population in 50 years is insane. Like, certifiably insane to lose that. One in a hundred of the amount of sharks that were alive for a lot of these species just 50 years ago. Yeah, shark fin soup is another thing. So a lot of Asian countries now view shark fins as delicacies. Don't even eat the shark. They kill the shark, cut off the fins, and then throw its dead body in the ocean. Um, I don't know the years or the dating on that. It's still something that happens. Uh, a lot of that has been internationally banned. Um, but those countries don't necessarily have to, uh, to listen. But... As I'm assuming Westerners, most of us are Westerners, considering we're all speaking English here. It's more important to consider that what we can do, right? Because we're not we're not stopping the shark fin soup industry. The most important thing is raising the next generation to not be so fucking terrified of sharks. We don't want this, you know, this in, you know, in person. Just this instilled fear in every human being for absolutely no legitimate reason is absolutely ridiculous. And it is, its effects are not the kind of thing that you can measure, right? Like, you can't just say, oh, because a bunch of people are, you know, 
a bunch of people are afraid of sharks that must you know equal this amount of sharks extra dying or this amount of you know negative public perception you can't draw direct conclusions like that but it seems pretty obvious that if an entire society brings uh, or, or believes an animal to be negative believes it to have no purpose in the ecosystem fears the animal and wants them dead or just does not give a shit about the animal at all uh, the animal is going to face serious consequences in society because no one is crying for these 99 percent of these species no one's giving a shit there are shark scientists yeah obviously they're going to give a shit but among the common people no one gives a shit they're not cute they're not they're not uh there's there's a word that i don't remember like faceable there's a word like that animals uh people tend to care a lot when faceable animals go extinct animals that you can look at and say oh i don't want that animal to go extinct and those animals tend to raise more money for efforts against their endangered uh no one gives a shit about fish no one gives a shit about sharks people aren't raising money for them so uh you know the issue is a societal perception the reality is probably a lot of shark species are going to go extinct and there's not much we can do about it anymore because there's not enough time to shift it but um raise your children without without a fear of sharks let them know when they see a show and a shark approaches and some evil music plays that uh you know it's over dramatized let them know that shark week is a bunch of horse shit let them know that jaws although an incredibly well put together movie is probably one of the most you know societally dangerous things we've done as far as you know the environment and ecosystems go uh in human history yeah you don't have to say fuck jaws for what it is jaws is a good it's a great movie the public's perception i don't think you can blame on the movie producers um especially it's not necessarily presented as fact Getting a shark plushie and fish mobile for my future kid. Great. There you go. Okay, so Tucci is my friend from Brazil. When he was little, there was a shark on our beach. Everyone celebrated when the fisherman killed him. Exactly. Everyone, especially, you know, in, in that kind of country, there's, it's just a general fear for sharks. There's no reason for anything else. People don't want to be eaten by a shark. And killing a shark is seen as a positive way to, to affect positive change in humans. So people kill sharks for absolutely no reason. Shark's not attacking anybody. It's not hurting anybody. It's just chilling around the shore, probably prowling. Gets killed by fishermen. Everyone applauds. No one gives a shit. Isn't there a Jaws novel? There is, yes. All right, so an interesting data that I wanted to take a look at. This is a plot that I made myself in Excel. This is the number of people killed by sharks per decade. <laughs> You're welcome, shark. You're welcome. <laughs> Just doing my part. Here, I'll turn. I got you. Hold on. Poggers. There you go. Thanks for representing me. I am but a young shark who is misunderstood in this fudged up world. Yeah. Well said, Mr. Shark. Well said. <laughs> I have a feeling I know who that was. I'm going to take a guess in my head, and then I'm going to look at PayPal. Yep. <laughs> was 100% right on who that was. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. You know who you are. Thank you, Mr. Shark. Anyways, the uh, amount of people killed by sharks every decade... Uh, this is the amount of people killed by sharks every decade. So you got 30s, 40s, 56. Basically, from the 30s to the 2010s, it's data on how many people are dying in the U.S. to shark attacks. So we already know it's exceptionally, exceptionally no low, less than one a year. Uh, you can see its peak in the 50s, nine people dying to shark attacks. Uh, that's over a decade. That's still less than one a year. Okay. And you might think this graph is interesting to look at. You've got the ups and downs. Uh, you've got clearly some representative data of sharks killing people. Until you take a look at the next slide. Uh, and this is a chart where the red line is the amount of sharks killed by people. This scale here is 150 million, by the way. This top line is 150 million. This is the red line is the amount of sharks killed by people. The blue line is the amount of people killed by sharks. And you might be thinking, Zach, where is the blue line? Well, guys, the blue line that I just showed you from the last chart 
is this flat line on the bottom of the graph that blends in with the x-axis because that's how fucking irrelevant it is. It's literally non-existent. At the, at the lowest point, this is around 24 million sharks killed. Sharks are evil at <laughs> killing our planet, don't listen. Oh, fuck. <laughs> There's a fucking conflict. Alright, Shark Killer 666. <laughs> we need to have a little talk. Show yourself in chat, okay? We'll have a little talk. <laughs> okay, so, the last thing to talk about is... How to just be a decent human being. I told you, you know, raise your kids not to be afraid of sharks. Address that bias in your mind when you're watching a show and, you know, evil music plays, you know, the dun-dun-dun, the fear of sharks. Just be like, hey, this doesn't make sense. That's all you have to say. You don't have to fucking, you know, entirely reshape your cognitive. You don't have to address all of your biases. Just say like, hey, that doesn't like, make a lot of sense. And as far as physically, here's how you avoid sharks. Don't swim at dawn or dusk. You shouldn't be swimming at dawn or dusk anyways. The ocean's cold. You know, don't do that. That's stupid. Don't wear shiny things. Shouldn't wear shiny things in the ocean anyways. You're gonna lose them, okay? If you're gonna see a shark, the last thing you want to do is panic and thrash and look like a seal or look like a fish and force them to make a split-second decision. When you panic and thrash when a shark is nearby you, you are forcing them to make a split-second decision. Melody, if there are no sharks in your pool, you can swim in your pool at night. And finally, swim in groups. Because what sharks generally are, when it comes to shark attacks, is curious. They're investigating with their mouth, or they think you're something else. They're curious, they're inquisitive, and they don't know. They are smart creatures, okay? But they're a lot less willing to be inquisitive and curious when they're encountering a group of organisms, rather than an individual which they feel safe taking on if they need to. So swim in groups. If you do all of these things, you have the Zachary guarantee the Zachary seal of approval that you will never ever get bit by a shark and if you do sue me I guess because it ain't gonna happen all right that is my shark presentation people had uh, said they had stuff they wanted to watch so if you wanted me to watch something or you have questions hit me up now now we have free time I did both my presentations Anything you guys want to know more about? Anything you want me to watch? Etc. Etc. Are great whites endangered? Eh, I think so. I don't know. Great white conservation status. Vulnerable. Not endangered. This is the step uh, above endangered. Means they could go endangered. Any shark plushie recommendations? I don't have a shark plushie. I have a fish plushie that, um, not my sister. Oh, a friend at college got me. Can't paste so I can say the title of the video? Uh, sure. That's fine. What is fish favorite food? So if I'm trying my hardest and I have no idea what that question means. Have you ever seen a shark IRL? I have. I have plenty of fun shark stories. You guys want to hear shark stories? I went snorkeling on vacation when I was little, and I pet a nurse shark, and my entire f family freaked out and screamed. Um, thought I was gonna die, but it was a nurse shark. Nurse sharks have zero interest in people. I think he thought I was a cleaner fish or something. Did you find your megalodon tooth? I didn't. It's in a case somewhere in my house. I probably packed it away in a Tupperware. What decides how frequently f sharks' teeth change? Um, I think it's just a natural process. New teeth come in to push out the old teeth on a regular schedule. It'll vary from shark to shark, individual to individual. But I don't think there's an active component. I don't think the sharks are thinking when they need to replace their teeth. I think it just happens. Don't nail the play button to the wall. I I'm not. It's leaning on my thing back there. Shark killer, I don't know who you are. I don't know what you want. 
But what I do have are a very particular set of skills. I will not look for you, I will not pursue you, but if you don't, I will look for you, I will find you, and I will kill you. Interesting. <laughs> Fucking battle between shark and shark killer 666. What fish is their favorite food? Uh, that's individual to individual or shark to shark. I don't know. How long does it take for them to grow their teeth back? I don't think they ever actually need to grow their teeth back, Bonsai. Um, from what I've, what I know about sharks, they basically have a, a line of, of teeth. I'm sure I can shark teeth grow back. Um, there's gotta be a diagram, right? Basically, there's a, there's a set always available. They can always grow out more as uh, some fall out. My Streamlabs is frozen. Can you guys still hear me? <laughs> okay. I have a feeling you guys are still talking in chat and I can't see it. Okay. I'll, I'll have to look at my phone's chat because my Streamlabs is frozen. As long as it's still loading, that's fine. Popped in after only finding your YouTube channel. Love what you're doing here. There's a guy who got bit by a shark in Soul Cal about two weeks ago. He was super chill about it. Was like, sure, I bled and had to go to the hospital, but it's all good. Let's all be like that guy. No, let's not be like that guy. Let's not get bit in the first place. Why do sharks get a blue screen if they are flipped upside down? Oh, shit. My thing updated. Thank you, creator. Oh, creator of Jaws 567. Jesus Christ. That guy's a badass. Yeah, no, no, I saw Roden. I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm answering questions first. I'll look after Roden. I will watch the, uh, I will watch the videos you have recommended after. I just, I want to listen to, I want to do Q&A first. Because when I do the videos, I'm going to put my headphones on. And I don't want to take them on and off. SoCal Sharks, shout out to Melody. Melody, go get bitten by a SoCal Shark and serve as a representative that sharks don't attack people twice. You thought they'd just peel back like a conveyor belt of spikes. That's not far off. Something along that line. Basically, just imagine a bunch of teeth lined up, ready to go. One pops out, the next one goes. Can I be best friends with a great white? I haven't seen great white bonds, but I've seen other smaller sharks have bonds with people. Um, sharks are smart enough to know that like, if they have a hook in their mouth or something that's stuck, uh, they'll go to divers to try and get them to... Um, to try and get them to remove the hook from them. And if the diver helps them, they'll, they'll hang around for a bit, be thankful, let the diver pet them, stuff like that. Or beagle shark. Sure. It's a pretty normal looking shark. Kind of looks like a mako, but not really. But kind of. Where's the shark pee pee? They have what's called claspers. It's kind of a shark penis. Oh, hi, Avery. <laughs> Bad timing. Bad timing. Okay, is there anything else or should I move to the videos? Viper dogfish? Doesn't sound like a shark, it sounds like a chimera. Jesus fucking Christ. It looks like a chimera too. I have seen this. It's gotta be a chimera, right? This can't be a shark. Huh. It's a shark. Good to know. That's what I see in my sleep paralysis. Are the shark species that live in groups, are they all solitary? It's a good question. All sharks that I know are solitary. Sharks living in groups. It would seem that there aren't any species. Dogfish are sharks? I believe so. But there are also these things called chimeras. There's also a lot of things in the Elasma branch family that often get mistaken for sharks that aren't sharks. Um, you look at Elasma branches as a whole. Kind of love my search history having Elasma branchy phylogeny in it. It's not even from recently. That's probably from months ago. 
Modern sharks, bullhead sharks, carpet sharks, mackerel sharks, ground sharks, frilled and cow sharks, dogfish, angel sharks, and saw sharks. So this is the important distinction. These are the sharks that you think of when you talk about sharks. The salachi, okay? That's like everything from great whites and all that. And then the squalomorphy are frilled and cow sharks, dogfish, angel sharks, and saw sharks. So these are all the weird sharks. Uh, they're still technically sharks, but they're in an, a, a different super order. Um, and then there's there's ray skates, saw, a sawfish, just batodi, batodia. Helicoprion is a chimera, is it? I wouldn't think it would fit into any modern group. It's of Eugen Eugenodontida. I don't think it's a chimera. I think it's just a chondric, these thing. Yeah, I don't think so. Some are social, I think. A few of the tipped ones. Interesting. Good to know. Sharks are cute. You showed a, a big photo of that big fish. I'm assuming you mean ocean sunfish. Oh, that used to be my background? What used to be my background? I have no idea. My background now is this thing that I made. It's just black with a cool white goldfish. I don't know what used to be my background. The big fish. Oh, oh. Namazoo. This dude. Giant earth catfish. That used to be my background, but it was too cluttered. So I made this instead. My background's very organized. Thank you. I have my regular stuff, and then I have my video games. You'll notice there's significantly more video games than there is anything else. And actually, most of these, like this and this, also apply to video games. I have Modern Warfare. I have um, Warzone. But I haven't played it in a while, so there's probably like 200, uh, 200 gigabytes to update. No, I don't. I've never played Halo. Webkins blow really? Shut it. Webkins is hype. The games on Webkins are awesome. Alright. Would you play Subnautica? I've been interested in Subnautica. Nick specifically was going to get me Subnautica for my birthday. How good is Subnautica for someone who likes marine biology? Like, would it be something that I... The sunfish are made entirely of gelatin? No, not quite. What kind of biology do you do? I do fish biology. I do what's called ichthyology, which is a study of fish, and my focus is on disease and pathology in fishes. It's basically parasites, diseases, viruses, all that kind of stuff. Basically, I'm specialized for working in aquaculture systems uh, where they raise fish uh, in preventing uh, diseases and Grow stuff up. like that. <laughs> it's amazing. Get the game first. Okay. How much is Subnautica? I might, I might do some Subnautica. I've been interested. $25. Alright. We'll look into it. Yeah, the grow up does make me very suspicious that that is so. F What's your favorite fish? It used to be the red tail catfish, but nowadays I think it's the it's the coelacanth. So it used to be this guy. Actually, it's my shirt is packed. So I'm going to see Soph in chat in a couple days. So I've packed a bunch of stuff, including that shirt. But I have a shirt that says red tail catfish on it. I could probably find it. Yeah, I have this shirt. Pretty cool. It's black, though. This shirt. Pretty dope. Says Red Tail Catfish. It used to be my favorite fish, but I uh, I recently started uh, loving coelacanth. Fucking love this fish. In Subnautica, the only fish you require to kill is the little guys for food, but you can eat other stuff. Oh, I have no issue killing fish in games. I don't even really have issues killing fish in, in real life when it's morally justified. Do a top 10 video about your favorite fish? I don't know how interested people would be in that. Do a fist fighting stream with Soph? Maybe. Do 
Do game share me on Steam for one dollar? I don't know what game share means. And the wars war zone is like free. <laughs> so I don't know what, what do you want? So if thinks she can kick my ass, she can't. Some old fish facts. I actually I have a TikTok. I have a TikTok called this where I've done um like facts videos on coelacanth and other stuff like that for a brief period of time uh soph is 5'3 and i'm like 5'7 so you know a little bigger also way stronger hey pog you nair who you playing top 10 reasons why the coelacanth should be your beloved hmm well don't know about that Link us the TikTok. Is there a TikTok browser thing? Can you do that? Oh yeah, look at that. Oh, you have to play Jada? Oh, you're fucked. Jada is really, really good. This is my TikTok. Here. Thank you, Soph. There's a video on Mola Molas. There's a video on coelacanths. There's a video with my fish tattoo. Then there's a video about why keeping fish in bowls is harmful. Is it supposed to be fish parent? No, it is not. Paren is Russian for like dude. It's fish dude. Fish boy wasn't available. Fish man wasn't available. All that. So I just did a mixture of English and Russian fish bottom. They look shitty. They're on BTS Smash. Trust me, Beetle King is not shitty. <laughs> Beetle King can beat Willy. <laughs> Alright, should I watch the other videos now? Alright, let me scroll up and find what um, Roden wanted me to watch. I'll watch the one I'm more interested in. Top, then, top 30 terrifying pre SD sea monsters. I might not know anything about that. Top five unexplained mysterious sea creatures. Okay, I'll do that one. I doubt that I'll be much help, but. Um, which one? What if finding Nemo was real? Uh, Nemo would have fucked his dad. Actually. Nemo's dad would have become a woman, and then he would have fucked Nemo. Uh, which video? Roden? It's by Top Fives. It's this one, then. Oh, wait. There's Top... There's two. I think it's this one. We'll look at this one. Hold on. When are you going to make the video about lionfish? I didn't know I was making a video about lionfish. I had no plans. I think this is it. Top five unexplained sea, ca sea creatures. It's the wrong one. Top five unexplained. Oh, this one? By top fives, I see. I hope you don't rant a lot while watching the video. It depends how poorly the information is presented. I listen, I a lot of people on the video were saying I don't have an open mind. I have an open mind. I am I am down for speculation. I'm down to be wrong and learn about things. Um But when information is presented in clearly false ways, it's uh, it's a problem. Okay. I need to get my audio loud enough that I can hear it out loud. There is no denying that the ocean is the most fascinating place on our planet, and the ocean and space are the two things we are surrounded by yet know so little about. Every time an explorer plunges into the ocean, it's unlikely that they will come back up to the surface without discovering a new species or variety of creature. But every now and then, an unknown creature is washed up on a beach, or something is spotted during an expedition that cannot be explained. These things, once again, show us the endless possibilities the ocean is home to.
Sit back and know that everything talked about in this video is sharing the planet with you. Shark eaten by unknown sea creature. In 2003, Australian filmmaker Dave Riggs and his crew were asked to tag an adult great white shark along Australia's coast so they could monitor its behaviour. One of the first great whites they managed to tag was a magnificent nine foot long female. She was strong, healthy and given the name Alpha. Four months later, her tag was washed up on a beach and was handed in by somebody walking by. After reviewing the information from the tag, the researchers were left confused at what had happened. The data revealed that at 4am on the 24th of November 2003, the shark suddenly plunged at high speed 520 metres down the edge of a continental shelf. It also indicated a massive change in temperature from 46 degrees to 78 degrees in seconds. The only explanation the researchers could give was that Alpha had been devoured by another living creature and was deep inside its belly during the recordings. The tag seemed to carry on recording from within the predator's belly for a further 8 days before finally being excreted and washed up on the beach. So what could possibly eat a 9 foot long healthy great white shark? Up until this point, he's presented everything factually, presented it in a good way. I have no issues with this video so far. However, I have a feeling that that'll uh, take a change <laughs> when you get to what could possibly have done the thing. But I haven't commentated as of now. I have heard of this. Um, I believe the prevailing theories were like sperm whales or orca whales, or something of the sort. Some kind of predatory, um, predatory mammal that then did a deep dive after. I don't know. It's hard to tell. It's also hard to trust tracker information, um, especially when this is a one-time occurrence. This was something that happened multiple times. I could see, uh, you know, finding more of a reason with it. But for people to latch so hard onto one tracker experience, I mean, the tracker changed locations very rapidly and indicated a different temperature very rapidly um which i would think to me more than anything else would indicate the tracker was fucked up uh but there's also lots of possibilities so let's hear how realistic they are while there have been many theories ranging from an orca or a giant unknown sea creature orca astonishingly it took 11 years before a plausible theory was released dave rig himself theorized the only explanation could be that another even larger <laughs> cannibal oh come on man this is, the dumb, this is what I was saying. He was talking about orcas. I hate the way that these people pre present these videos. He said the only reasonable. It was 10 years before anyone presented a reasonable explanation. People had talked about orcas. Things that are actually capable of eating great white sharks. Things that sharks are scared of. Or the fact that the tracker can just malfunction. You know. Very, very reasonable things. And then he hits you with the, it was 10 years before a real, but those, those weren't real. A real explanation came out. It must have been eaten whole by a colossal super shark. I also like how a matter of a fact this is. The mystery solved. This is the only possible explanation. There is no other explanation for why a tracker tag might give you a wild temperature reading and a wild location reading. No other reason. Dave Rigg himself theorized the only explanation could be that another, even larger, cannibal great white shark was responsible. One that would have been almost twice Alpha's size and weighed over two tons, making it one of the largest great whites ever recorded. The only other explanation that was brought up is that the tracker fell off Alpha and was eaten by another fish. So what do you think happened? Did the <laughs> How can you present those two alongside each other? <clears throat> well, the tracker fell off the fish. Or a giant sea monster ate the whole shark whole. <laughs> or it could be a megalodon. I do like, I love how different those two theories are put side to side, how ridiculous it makes his theory sound. If his theory had came second, it would sound stupid as hell. If you said, well, the tracker could have been, could have, could have fallen off. Or it could be a sea monster. You sound stupid as hell. But if you say, well, it could be a sea monster, or, you know, maybe it could have fallen off. It's like he's purposely ordering things in a way that diminishes how much you perceive how ridiculously stupid the argument is. Did the tracker simply fall off and was eaten by a smaller fish that thought it was bait? 
Or was Alpha pulled deep down in the ocean and eaten? Nope. ...by an enormous undiscovered predator. <laughs> a furry creature washes up on beach. In early 2015, a mysterious carcass of a creature was found washed up on an island called Sakhalin, which is located along the east coast of Russia. The carcass was ripped apart, covered in blood, had bones protruding from its body, and was unusual in the fact that it had a long beak and was around 11 feet in length. It's a, it's a whale, or like a dolphin. Just gonna state that. At first it was identified by experts to be some kind of rare big dolphin species, but people argue that due to its fur and large size, this is an unlikely candidate. So what exactly was it? Well, despite a few theories, there hasn't been any real explanation. It's unsure if DNA samples were taken, and if they were, nothing has been released. How it ended up on the beach in the first place is also a mystery, since the water around that area is colder than most fish this size would usually live in. This led researchers to think whatever it was may have been brought in by a warm current and died when the waters cooled. Not long after its discovery, another study was done by a group of scientists who came to the conclusion that the carcass could have been a whale cub, possibly that of a beaked whale. Since most whales and dolphins are born with hair that they lose quickly, this would explain the fur, but this would have meant that if it was a beaked whale or dolphin cub, it would have been a very large one. Another theory is that it's just a rare large dolphin and the hair is degraded tissue fibers. But more interestingly, some think- I was gonna say that more than anything. Uh, you can't underestimate the power of decay. I mean, the, I don't know if you guys have ever seen something fleshy decay, but the, the states of matter that it goes through are wild. Like, wildly different. Tissue decay, I mean, tissue, muscle tissue, is, in essence, a bunch of fibers that are just really tightly wound together. Thought that the hair they are born with are only found on their snout. Changes from species to species. But uh, muscle fibers, muscle tissue, is just a, basically a very bunch of very tiny fibers really tightly wound together. Uh, so when that kind of decay, decomposition happens on land in an environment where the animal isn't intended to decay in the first place, the appearance of hair seems pretty likely. I think that it's an undiscovered sea creature, which with its size and the unexplored areas within the ocean, this, like all the theories mentioned, cannot be ruled out. Once again, throwing in the, the unexplored size of the ocean bullshit in there. Gotta love it. I, I don't disagree that any of these things could be legitimate evidence of, uh, you know, an unexplained sea creature, species that we don't know about. But uh, throwing in the, it might be because the ocean's unexplored is so bullshit, and I've already talked so much about it in the Megalodon video that I'm not going to do it in this one. This next mystery is actually another washed up creature. Now, I was going to include this thing, which is called the Montauk Monster, that was found washed ashore a beach in New York in 2008. But after reading a lot about it, although it hasn't been fully identified, it doesn't seem like it came from the ocean. Whereas this next one I'm going to talk about most certainly isn't land-based. There isn't a whole lot of information on this, but it was found by a group of people in 2013 on New Zealand's Bay of Plenty Beach. This area is known for having sea creature carcasses washed up, but this one... You say he's flipping you off? He had his middle finger It's actually another washed up creature. Now, I was going to include this thing, which is called the Montauk Monster. <laughs> I was found washed yeah. ashore a beach in yeah, he do. New York in 2008. But after reading a lot about on this, but it was found by a group of people in 2013 on New Zealand's Bay of Plenty Beach. This area is known for having sea creature carcasses washed up, but this one caused a little more mystery, as it was unlike anything previously seen. Its body was 30 feet long and was mostly buried under the sand, but its head and a large dorsal fin could be seen, which led a marine biologist to think that it was most likely an orca because of this distinctive fin, but this couldn't be 100% confirmed because of its badly decomposed body. Some say that since the jawline, even after decomposition, is so narrow though, that it's definitely not an orca, but it could be an unknown species of whale or an undiscovered creature. The teeth do look similar to that of a killer. Am I crazy, or did the jawlines look the exact same? I'm not an orca expert. But, like, the teeth... The side-by-side -side convinces me. <laughs> like, he's talking about the differences in the, in the width of the jawline. 
But like, I don't know, man. And the teeth, pretty damning. We use teeth to identify a lot of stuff. You can identify almost any, like, any human being by their teeth, let alone species of animal by their teeth, you know? Teeth are really, really, really good way of identifying creatures because they're usually very unique to a, to a particular species. So if a species has teeth, you can usually identify it by its teeth. And the similarities in the teeth, I think, are enough for me where I would be confident if I was called to this scene to conclude that it was a marine biologist. Yeah, this does have, these are, these are better quality things. These are legit. He's not presenting really any non-factual information. He's making big jumps, making big assumptions, but that's fine. A lot of people on the Megalodon video were talking about how I wasn't open-minded to the things that the person had to say, when like most of the things he had to say were like photos from mockumentaries, things from Mythbusters episodes, him just totally making shit up and claiming credibility. That's what I had an issue with. Not that not the the idea that the Megalodon could be extinct so much as the certifiable deniability of all of the facts. Um, this video is much much better. I am I am not enraged. I'm actually interested. It's actually kind of a fun game. Do I think that any of the things we've seen so far are undiscovered species? No, probably not. I think I can be pretty safe in my assessment so far that the things that we've seen are the things that I, I, I've guessed. Um, but I'm not unwilling to say that I could be wrong. Orca, but it could be an unknown species of whale or an undiscovered creature. The teeth do look similar to that of a killer whale, so who knows? What do you think? Was it an orca, some type of whale, or a prehistoric creature that we have yet- <laughs> That's so funny. He, he presents information well and then does the speculation after. The teeth look exactly like an orca. The jaw looks exactly like an orca. But the scientist couldn't 100% confirm it's an orca. So what do you think? Is it an orca, a whale, and then shows a picture of a fucking mosasaur? Or a prehistoric beast? To discover. The 52 Hertz Whale. This next mystery has been around for a while and is actually quite sad. It's the 52 Hertz Whale, often called the loneliest whale in the ocean. It's the story of an unidentified sound that was recorded in the Pacific Ocean in 1989 that is thought to belong to a solitary, unidentified species that is looking for a mate. 52 Hertz is the frequency of the sound which is much higher than any other known whale call. The blue whale is usually 10 to 39 Hertz and a fin whale is around 20 Hertz, making a 52 Hertz call out of the ordinary. It's unsure if it's a male or female or if it's even a whale, but it's definitely something and something that sounds pretty big. The sound has been tracked every year by scientists since it was first discovered, and incredibly, the tone of the sound has deepened over the years, as it would with a regular whale call. Take a listen. It's, it's sped up heavily gots, otherwise you wouldn't be able to hear it. Uh, yeah, that does give off creepy vibes. <laughs> I do feel like I'm watching like a short horror story or something on YouTube. But, um, yeah, I mean, it sounds like a whale call. I'm down with the idea that that's a whale call. I am, I'm, I'm, I'm with, I'm with him so far on this one. Despite comprehensive monitoring and searching, nothing has been found. <laughs> look at the look at the background. It's a whale on a, a musical. <laughs> what song is this? Can we identify this song? I don't know what song that is. What does a baby whale sound like? Fuck if I know. I don't think baby whales would do a lot of calling. I'm sure they do, but the main point of whale calling is mating, I believe. So. Unless the babies are trying to get some fuck, I would generally think that they're not that into it, you know? And nobody's sure what is creating the sound. There has been some speculation that it's a malformed blue whale or a mix of blue whale and another species. 
If it is the sound of a whale, then just think it could be the call of an undiscovered species that is the last of its kind left in the world. Unfortunately though, all that we are left with is the sound that this incredible creature makes, easily making it one of the ocean's biggest mysteries. An interesting side note is that a documentary about the search for the 52 Hertz whale is being released soon. The documentary was funded by Kickstarter, and Leonardo DiCaprio gave $50,000 to help the campaign hit its target, which it did. The team recently went out in search for the whale, and I believe they are working on the documentary now, which I am super excited to see. I'm guessing by the fact that it's not, uh, not discovered, that there's not been news that they didn't actually find it, which is kind of sad. It's a cool mystery to have answered. Because the reality is it's probably a malformed whale. It just has a super weird call. You know? Like, um... Basically, this whale is the corpse <laughs> of the ocean. Now, corpse is, has a acid reflux, and his voice is stupid deep. Basically, this whale just ha has something wrong, and his call's super wrong, you know? I doubt he's as lonely as they think. Hopefully they find him. He's still alive, I'm pretty sure. I think they're still tracking it. <laughs> it's the corpse whale. People like corpse, people like the whale. I don't think he has throat cancer, probably just something he was born with, malformed. They said that it deepened over time, which would indicate that when they first started tracking the call, it was like a teenager, you know? My homie has a weird voice? Right. And they don't call your homie the loneliest whale in the ocean, you know? That'd be kind of fucked up. <laughs> so, you know. Be nice to whales. Mysterious Giant Shark In early 2000, scientists from Japan conducted a study to learn more about marine life in the Mariana Trench. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with the Mariana Trench, it's thought to be the deepest part of any of the world's oceans, and is located in the western... I just want to just want to say, this exact video of this, which is, by the way, a sleeper shark, uh, was used in the Megalodon video. <laughs> but yeah, it's a sleeper shark. Um... Some people find, the whales find his deep call sexy, like some people find corpse uh, voice sexy. Yeah, maybe. A lot of people are into corpse for his voice. Yeah, corpse whale probably plays Among Us. He's probably the most popular Among Us player because of his voice. Corpse whale. Is that what we're going to call the whale now? Corpse whale? It seems insensitive somehow, but I can't quite come up with a reason that it is insensitive, so I'm going to keep saying it. <laughs> Maybe it's like, uh, there's actually, a, okay, this is an interesting, I want to, I want to talk about this because I'm interested in this. Sometimes, mm, so you would think like malformities, disabilities, stuff like that would be not liked in the animal kingdom, uh, if, especially if there's selective mating. You know, if, if an animal wants to choose a mate, you generally don't want to choose a mate that is malformed, has issues, uh, stuff like that. But sometimes... Uh, something can happen so much to the extreme that um, it's actually it's st and it stays attractive. So there was a bird species which lived in like a, an area that had um, very little food, and they grew dark feathers on their chest um, in order to basically show off that they were well nourished. They were capable of hunting. They were eating lots of fruit, uh, lots of food. And the females would choose the males based on how dark their chest was, basically an indication of how much nourishment the bird was getting because it was able to produce that, that coloration in their plumage. And a rare melanistic, which if you don't know what that is, it's the opposite of albino. So an albino creature is an animal lacking color. A melanistic is one that is black. Um, a melanistic bird was found in the population and despite being totally fucked up, had uh, got all the bitches, basically. <laughs> basically a bird that got all the bitches. Isn't that evolution? No. Well, it could be. Um, everything's evolution in reality. Every little thing that happens in the animal kingdom is evolution. But uh, not necessarily, because 
it's only attractive to them because it's an outlier. If all of the birds suddenly were melanistic and had, you know, black plumage, then it would no longer be a desirable trait because every mate would have it, and then you'd have to choose mates based on something else. Uh, so it's not really evolution in the way that it, it loses advantage if anyone else does it. It's just kind of a weird malformity. <laughs> okay. Blackbird, best bird? Uh, I mean, listen, he was born with a, a skin, not skin, a color deformity, and now he gets all the bitches. In early 2000, scientists from Japan conducted a study to learn more about marine life in the Mariana Trench. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with the Mariana Trench, it's thought to be the deepest part of any of the world's oceans and is located in the Western Pacific. Now, its precise depth is hazy, but it's thought the trench is about 6.8 miles deep. At these depths, it's hard to believe anything could survive, but surprisingly, there are many fish and living organisms down there, which I will talk more about in a documentary about the Mariana's Trench. Anyway, the Japanese scientists were studying an area not far from the trench called the Suruga Bay. They had submerged a container with special bait at a depth of around one mile, in hopes of capturing on camera whatever wanted to feed on it. This is a common way of videoing and identifying new and existing sea creatures. At first, the camera picked up a few small known sea creatures, followed by a shoal of rare deep sea sharks that measured six foot long. If this wasn't exciting enough for the researchers, the sharks scattered quickly and a huge creature came into view. Its size cannot be justified on the video footage, but the researchers said it would have been between 30 to 50 feet in length. Just know the Guinness World Record for the largest shark is 37 feet, so if the proportions the researchers have given are correct, this could be the largest shark ever recorded. Take a look. So we talked about it earlier, but that's a that's a sleeper shark. I'm not confident enough to say a Pacific sleeper shark, but it's a sleeper shark. Um, yeah, there's not much else to say about that. I've talked about scale in the ocean. How you don't know how big the cage is. Uh, you don't know how big the shark is. <clears throat> but even at the maximum size, uh, yeah, I did, Roden. Even at the maximum size, it's it's really not uh, horribly unbelievable that a large sleeper shark that was just stupid old was chilling top fives probably doesn't know what a sleeper shark is uh, i'm sure he'll talk about it i'm sure he will let's let's give him a chance to talk about sleeper sharks let's see what he has to say maybe he'll say that it's definitely a sleeper shark and this one's a fake reason or maybe he'll say it must be a sea monster who fucking knows Scientists aren't exactly sure what type of shark it is, and people have said it could be the long thought to be extinct Megalodon, the gigantic monster of the sea that lived over 2 million years ago and is labelled the largest, most powerful predator in history. I wondered where he was going to go with it. I said, hey, maybe he'll, maybe he'll say it's a sleeper shark, and somehow we got back to the Megalodon. But another theory is that the footage caught a very large, very rare Pacific sleeper shark. Sleeper sharks can grow to lengths of 23 feet. Yay! Well, it did come after the Megalodon theory, but at least we eventually got to the fact that it's a sleeper shark. He was doing so well, why did he have to bring Megalodon up? True. I was, I was praising this guy and only providing facts and talking about assumptions after, presenting evidence well. But uh, it always comes back to the Megalodon, doesn't it, huh? 
Why does it have to be that? Well, what is people's obsession with the Megalodon? What is it specifically about that? There's so many ancient, like, cool, even if you just want to look at sharks, there's so many, so much cooler sharks. Yeah, but the Megalodon is literally just that. It's just a big shark. There are sharks that had fucking whirly teeth. There are sharks that had all kinds of crazy shit going on. Why are we so obsessed with just a really big shark? <laughs> Feet. So even if it was a sleeper, it would have been the biggest and longest of its kind to have ever been spotted. So that's five mysterious sea creatures. Don't forget, this is only a fraction of the creatures that must be out there. There is bound to be thousands of undiscovered species swimming around right now, and there are also many mythical creatures that people think could exist. But I'm saving those for another day. Okay. What time is it? Uh, I have time for one more short video. Alright. What what do you want me to watch? Megalodon is boring. Look up atop atopodentatus. The fuck is this? <laughs> Funny as shit. I've seen stuff like that. It does look like something from Star Wars. It's a bigger great white and Jaws sparked so much popularity with that. You're right. The Megalodon does most closely representative the fish from Shards. From, um, from Jaws. So people probably associate with that. Do your video. I was just wondering if anyone had anything else since you would suggest this one. Okay. How long is this video, Roden? Is the Greenland shark the same as the sleeper shark? You know, I used to think that, but I don't think it is. Yeah, closely related to the Pacific and Southern sleeper sharks. I did used to think they were the same thing, but they're not. It's this family of sleeper sharks that includes both of um, both the Pacific sleeper sharks and the Greenland shark. Because I used to refer to that shark as a Greenland shark, and I was corrected once. So. Okay, what was Rodin's thing called? Top 10 real sea monsters. I love how matter-of-a-fact the title is. Real sea monsters. 100% real. Subscribe right now, or you're going to have terrible luck for the next week. What the fuck is it with these channels and manipulating people right off the start? The first thing that that Megalodon video did was play some like horror movie clip and say you're gonna die if you don't like and subscribe. It, is there some kind of like fucking... You know why? You know why? Because this is fucking marketed to children. It is a credible source... It is marketed as a credible source to children. They want children to watch this, think it's a good thing to learn about, to watch. And the kind of thing that gets kids to click like and subscribe is threatening them. I feel like every dumb YouTuber we watch with shark videos always threatens their viewer as the fucking intro. I hate it. If you've watched movies like Meg and Jaws, you'd be scared of sea monsters. To some extent, at least. You'd be terrified of the things they could do to you. But you could also think that these monsters aren't real and are just the results of really, really good CGI work. But what if that's not true? What if sea monsters are real? What if they exist? What if they are prowling the sea right now? We actually don't have to wonder. Sea monsters are real, and today, we'll be checking out 10 of the most terrifying sea monsters. Before you start, we've been mandated to give you a fair warning. What you will see may traumatize you for life. Number 10. The sea cucumber. <laughs> what you see may traumatize you for life. <laughs> the fucking sea cucumber. Oh god. I don't think I can go on. <laughs> you gotta at least start with a scarier one. And the fucking sea cucumber. Come on. <laughs> the real sea monster. This will traumatize you for life. 
holy shit, I'm never going near the... I'm not even going to go within 100 miles of the ocean just out of fear that this thing might come after me. Does the name Sea Cucumber sound scary to you? Of course not. And if we're going to be fair, the Sea Cucumber isn't scary in the regular kind of way. What makes this sea monster truly monstrous is a biological function that it performs when it's pursued by predators. However, before we get to that, let's learn a thing or two about these sea cucumbers. Okay, well, I wasn't going to bring it up, but since Joa is, is going to bring it up, I will bring it up. Yes, sea cucumbers have a symbiotic relationship with fish. Fish uh, swim into and hide in their anuses. Uh, cleans out the sea cucumber's anus and protects the fish. So there you go. Enjoy that fact that you didn't have to know, but Joa brought it up. The first thing that you should know is that the sea cucumber is probably just as smart as the cucumbers we eat in salads today. Yeah, that's true. The sea cucumber doesn't have a brain, and it doesn't have sensory organs either. This means that the fact that the animal even exists is a puzzle to scientists. Aside from that, the animal has a very- There's a lot of animals that don't have brains or sensory organs, to be clear. We're not puzzled. They're pretty well classified. <laughs> like, we're not- there's no- He said scientists are puzzled. I hate when they do this. It's just like a subtle way to discredit science by acting like they don't know what they're talking about. We're not puzzled. They're just, they lack sensory organs. They lack central nervous systems and brains. Oh no, I'm not confused. <laughs> it's a pretty easy fact. Can you eat a sea cucumber? Probably shouldn't. You'll see, probably. I'm sure he'll tell you. A vulgar characteristic that would scare you. The sea cucumber is capable of contracting its muscles and expelling some of its internal organs out of its anus. This is done to ward off predators. And while this sounds disgusting, and looks disgusting as well, it works. As long as it works, huh? Number 9. So, so far, we've got a glorified slug as our first traumatizing sea monster, and I already see a chimera here. Bucktooth ghost shark. In South Africa, a new species of ghost shark was discovered and it's every bit as terrifying as you might have expected. After all, the name of this terrifying looking creature is Ghost Shark, and it isn't something like nice looking sharks or anything. The creature is about three feet in length and is said to be the second largest species of ghost shark ever discovered. I know your question. You're asking if this is even a shark at all. It's certainly a reasonable question because although the ghost shark looks downright terrifying, it doesn't look quite like regular sharks. So which is it? Is it a shark or not? Well, scientists have decided that the answer is no. Ghost sharks aren't actually sharks. Rather, they're large cartilaginous fish related to both sharks and rays. Unlike true sharks, these hybrids propel themselves with their large pectoral fins rather than their tails. This could be one of the reasons they're called ghost sharks in the first place. They look like sharks, but aren't quite sharks. It's cute. I like ghost sharks. I think chimeras are kind of cute when they're in the water. I'm not traumatized. I'm not scared. I'm kind of into it. Yeah, it's cool. It's kind of cute. I'm down. If he goes through all 10 of these and there's not a single thing that looks scary at all, I'm going to be upset. Spooky. Number eight. Giant grenadier fish. Yes, that's a fish. Yes, that's its mouth. And yes, that's real. This large fish with a horrifying mouth is known as the giant grenadier fish. This species of fish is usually found living at the depths of the sea, and they usually swim slowly in- I don't know, man. It's still kind of cute. I mean, when he mouth open, yeah, okay, I see a little, little scare when he mouth open, but I don't know. It's kind of cute. Kind of just looks like a goldfish that's lacking a full body. Like a goldfish, but from the the mid-torso. It kind of looks like a tadpole had sex with a goldfish. Yeah, he's just chilling. I don't know. What's your problem? Why you gotta, why you gotta, you know, be so mean to the little guy? In search of prey to eat. But when they do not find prey, they settle for animal carcasses. 
scientists have discovered that this kind of fish has incredibly high levels of a chemical called TMAO in its body. Without this chemical, the fish would be dehydrated by the surrounding seawater. This chemical is also what makes fishes smell like fishes. However, the problem with the giant grenadier fish is that it has too much of this chemical in its body. This means that it not only smells fishy, it's also stinky. Number seven. <laughs> Why is that a problem? Why is a deep ocean dwelling fish being stinky a problem? Do you really think it went through millions of years of evolution to smell good to humans? You know that's not the goal of a fish, right? Fish don't solely exist to smell good for humans. Yeah, you can't even smell. <laughs> it's the bottom of the ocean. What a stupid reason to be scared of something. And act like that's a bad trait. Like, oh, that's literally like, oh no, cows can't fly. Wait, but cows aren't supposed to fly. It doesn't provide them an evolutionary advantage. Yeah, they don't smell good if you bring them up to the surface. Oh no! That's not where they are anyways. Black Swallower. Living 2.7... Yeah, and also literally every fish smells bad. If you take two fish and one smells bad and the other one smells worse, I'm still like, okay, yeah, it smells bad. So... Kilometers below the surface of the sea isn't something that anyone or fish wants. But that's where the black swallower lives. And over thousands of years, this fish has developed characteristics. Does he realize that this is a catfish? That help it compete favorably in the depths of the ocean. Down in this forbidden part of the sea, food is plenty scarce. Does he know those aren't the same fish? This is... That video was of a different fish. This was just a... This is just like a freshwater catfish. Characteristics that help it compete favorably in the depths of the ocean. Down in this forbidden part of the sea, food is plenty scarce. And to get by, you have to be something different. And that's exactly what the black swallower is. This monster fish can swallow a fish more than twice its size and- It is funny as shit that he started the video by talking about sea monsters and how you're going to be traumatized, and not a single thing he's presented has been over three feet long. Ten times its mass in just one gulp. What makes us even more remarkable is the black- He's showing catfish again. This is an aquarium catfish. By no means a huge fish. It's only 25 centimeters long, and quite slender as well. However, despite this, it has developed the ability to turn other, way bigger fish into breakfast in record time. To aid the black swallower, nature gave it several long, hooked front teeth that can be pushed inward to allow the prey to move through its jaws, and then pushed back to lock it inside. Once a fish gets between the jaws of the swallower, it's game over. I mean, these are just... <laughs> I'm just amazed that he did not notice the clear difference between the fish that he's talking about and the fish that he's showing a video of. I mean, all you have to do is look at the barbels to see this is whole is a whole ass different fish. Side. Once the fish gets between the jaws of the swallower, it's game over. By the way, these are synodontuses. Synodonti. Synodontes. My favorite fish. This is the same species as Dojda. This is the same species as Bleska. My favorite fish that I have. I have a fish about this size named Dojda. Both fish have big stomachs, so must be same fish. Ah, yes. Deep water, ocean dwelling, high pressure fish, and catfish with a big stomach. Yep. Number six. Sheep's head. If How the fuck are any of these terrifying sea monsters? I want to be scared, goddammit. If you've watched Spongebob, you've probably seen a lot of talking fish. But what if you saw one of those fish in real life? Would you be terrified out of your mind? Probably, and that's why the sheep's head fish is terrifying. The sheep's head looks like a pretty normal fish. So normal, in fact, that you may not even want to check it out. But if you did, and you tried to open its mouth, you'd be shocked out of your mind. 
right in the middle of this fish's mouth sits rows and rows of human-like teeth. Yeah, that's right, human-like teeth. It's often said that the most horrifying things lay in plain sight, and it seems that this is so f Oh no. Ah. <laughs> He's gonna put goldfish in first place. And the comet goldfish. <laughs> the most terrifying sea creature of all. For the sheep's head. But how do these fish have human teeth? Was it an evolutionary accident? Did a crazy scientist try to create a mermaid? What exactly happened? Well, all we can say is that the teeth, or chompers, of this fish make it easier for them to destroy shellfish. So maybe their teeth formation was just a result of evolution playing its dirty tricks and nothing much else. Just maybe. Number five, anglerfish. The anglerfish is- This is the actual first one that has been realistically scary to any human being ever. Literally every other one he's been, he's done has been like a small, less than three foot fish. At least he finally, you know what, it took him, what is this, the sixth? The fifth. No wait, this is the sixth because it's number five. It took him six different fish to finally get to one that is actually not that non-scary. So congratulations, man, you did it. Anglerfish. The anglerfish is commonly referred to as the sea devil by sailors. That's the first sign you need to know that this fish is certainly not messing about with anyone. These fish are experts at lurking at the deepest parts of the sea, like the terrifying Mariana Trench, where sunlight is a fable, a story told by old men whose eyes are now dim and whose mind has been afflicted with sickness. In these depths of the ocean, monsters like the sea devil wait for their prey. The mouth of the anglerfish is so large that it can eat any animal that comes its way, Anglerfish literally inhaled their prey whole, and on the off chance that the prey of the anglerfish is too big for it, it's torn down by sharp fangs. But that isn't what makes the anglerfish truly scary. The fish has a glowing rod that hangs right in front of its mouth. I do genuinely think that there's like a library of copyright free background music that all of these shitty facts channels share because i swear i hear the same songs over and over again on different channels on different videos they just have like a google drive folder that they all take their music from and since deep water fish are usually attracted to light they gravitate towards this monster that will most likely kill them thankfully you'll almost never be attacked by an anglerfish you simply wouldn't be able to get deep enough in the water to have an encounter with it Number four, lamprey. The lamprey isn't a particularly scary looking fish. In fact, it looks- Have you noticed how literally every time he has started off with, well, this isn't a particularly scary fish. It's not scary in the traditional way. It doesn't look scary. So just none of these are scary? Because literally every time he started off with, well, it's, it's not actually scary looks pretty normal, all things considered. However, you must know that the scariest animals all look pretty normal. Well, roughly speaking, anyway. Now, the terrifying thing about the lamprey is that it looks eerily like something that it's not. It looks like a fish, but it's a parasite, and it's a very huge one. Lampreys thrive in all environments, whether it be salt waters, freshwater lakes, or even shallow waters. They're everywhere you can imagine, and they're paramount parasites they're kind of cute. I don't know, man. I kind of like them. It's of the sea. They prey on fish and leave round, gaping wounds that just refuse to heal. The horror of lampreys is that they don't only attack fish. They also attack swimmers as well. But the horror doesn't only lie in the fact that lampreys are parasites. After all, there are many different parasites on Earth. The horror lies in the way that these life... Uh, I think lampreys can do both. Yeah, I'm yeah, I mean lampreys eat chunks out of fish. But like so does other fish, like sharks, and like a lot of whales, and like human beings, and like birds, and like bears, and like foxes, and like coyotes, and like cats, like dogs. So 
Color me not terrified by the concept. Forms attack their prey. To feed, lampreys attach themselves to their host with a sucking mouth and a ring of sharp teeth. Once they've latched on, they begin to bore into the flesh of the animal using their long barbed tongues. As you can expect, this is a very painful process. To make things even worse, these animals release anticoagulants, which are blood thinners. This means that after the lamprey moves on from the host, the host doesn't stand a chance of surviving for long after. If that doesn't scare you, nothing will. Number three. Well, I guess nothing will ever scare me. Wait, what the fuck is this? <laughs> Wait, we were talking about tiny fish, and now I'm looking at a fucking underwater giraffe. Okay, sorry for pausing. I gotta know what's about to happen, because what the fuck is this? The Loch Ness Monster. Come on. It says right there, top 10 real sea monsters. He's been talking about actual living fish that he just thought were a little scary for one reason or another. How did you get to the fucking Loch Ness Monster? You probably think the Loch Ness Monster is the stuff of myths and legends. Well, we used to. Until a long-necked aquatic dinosaur with four flippers and a broad, crocodile-like body was found in Alberta, Canada, scientists posit that this animal has all the inklings of what we call the Loch Ness Monster today. It's huge, has a long neck that would be able to stick out of the water like the legendary Loch Ness Monster, and has the body the size of a medium-sized car. To make things even scarier, this beast wasn't even fully grown, so it's likely that they may have turned out to be larger. However, you should pump those bricks. Look at this fucking image. This is what you want me to believe is the Loch Ness Monster. There are- I could count the pixels. I can actually see the squares. According to scientists, this ancient animal died out millions of years before humans, so it's unlikely that any human alive ever saw it. But scientists have been wrong before, and they might be wrong this time. No, he was doing okay, and then he went into the Faxopedia thing. Well, scientists might be wrong. They've been wrong before. Maybe they're wrong this time. <laughs> ah, yes, the 47 pixels on my screen must be a prehistoric animal. <laughs> well said. Time to. Now it's time for today's best pick. This picture was sent in by a subscriber. If you ever see a picture that you'd like to know more about, you can send it in to us. Who knows, your picture may even get featured in a future video. Number two, Frilled Shark. The Frilled I, I'm so confused. Wildly confused. Shark has remained the same over so much of its 80 million year history that scientists now believe that it's a living fossil. But how did this scary looking shark get its name? Easy, just take a look at its mouth, and you'll get the answer that you desire. In the How? How did- what was before the, the Loch Ness Monster? I just want to address the, the list of events here. We went from- I don't even remember. Lamprey. We went from Lamprey, an actual existing creature. That's not that scary to the fucking Loch Ness Monster. And now we're back to a real existing shark again. So he really just threw in the Loch Ness Monster in a list of 10 real sea creatures. Never ever would I think that the sea cucumber would be in the same list as the Loch Ness Monster. I cannot think of a single list you could create where a sea cucumber and a Loch Ness Monster go in it together. <laughs> Spooky maw of this terrifying creature is a jaw with over 300 pointed teeth which resembles rows of sharp and terrifying frills. These fish stretch up to 5 feet and use their chompers to hunt down fish, sharks, and squids. Thankfully, you don't have to be scared of frilled sharks. They're rarely seen unless you go into the deepest parts of the sea. Before we move on, I've got a little challenge for you that'll take 5 seconds to complete. So, here's the deal. You just leave a like on this video, smash that subscribe button, and hit the notification bell, and you will get 25 years of amazing luck. So threatening them at the beginning of the video didn't work, so bribe them at the end of the video. 
Try it. It really works. Number one. Giant squid. First, the giant squid. This is the first one that I've been like, okay. The other nine have just been dumb as shit. This is the first one I'm willing to hear out. I don't know why you do the giant squid. Isn't the colossal squid bigger? Yeah, the colossal squid is bigger, isn't it? Than the giant squid? So I don't know why you do the giant squid when you could do an even bigger one. But, hey, go off, King. I guess do you had videos of two different fish that you were claiming to be one, so clearly you didn't do that much research has never been captured alive. Secondly, it exists, and it's terrifying. There are enormous sea creatures that scientists estimate could grow up to 45 feet long. They are heavy and are almost near impossible to even catch. Thankfully, these squids don't travel in packs and have no interest in human beings. However, on rare occasions, they could pose a threat to a small fishing boat. In fact, scientists are now convinced that most sightings of strange sea monsters are actually sightings of the giant squid. Isn't that a fun thought? Okay. That was something. <laughs> Fuck you. I, uh, I don't have concluding words. I don't know what you want me to say. It's, it's hard. The problem with these type of videos where you have like sea monsters and shit like that, that is a weird ass car. Uh, the problem with these videos is you come into the video with less knowledge than them. So you're already starting with a disadvantage, right? Oops. Hold on. You're already starting with a huge disadvantage before they are. Um, right? Like, it's hard to argue with someone who has photos and stuff that you've never seen before. Because I'm live on stream. I don't have time to do research on the video. I don't have time to ensure that everything he said is correct. I don't have time to, you know, find the source. I don't have time to look it over and consider similar things and look back and forth. I'm just going off pure intuition in the moment, uh, which makes it significantly harder to argue. So the kind of situation that videos like this put you in is that it's just uh, naturally shitty for trying to disprove their points. Um, and for the most part, this video was fine. I mean, it was it was nine things that I guess a four-year-old might be scared of if they were very dumb. Uh, and then the Loch Ness Monster, for some fucking reason, came in at number eight. Um, yeah. That's about all I got. That is all I have for stream today. I, uh, I did a presentation on lump suckers and salmon farms. Uh, I did a presentation on sharks. We watched three different videos. So that could be, uh, five, five different YouTube videos. If you uh, stop by for the first time today uh, and you've never been here before, what's up? Thanks for hanging out. If you found me through YouTube, what's up? Thanks for hanging out. I do a, uh, I do a lot of uh, a lot of game stuff, but I also do some fish stuff. Uh, this Sunday, I'm doing a subathon, which is basically just a stream that lasts as long as uh, like it gets extended by subs and bits and stuff like that. So um, if you want to come hang out with that, that's cool. I'm glad you enjoyed, Rodan. 25 years of amazing luck. So good I took the most blurriest picture of a new giant alien-like shark, but as expected, the, pro <laughs> the professional said it was proven to be a goldfish. Yeah, they did get rid of the bits for ads. Hi, Mace Dog. I'm ending stream. But thank you for hanging out, everybody. Uh, if you're new, hey, come again. Come Sunday. You can ask me any questions you want while I'm streaming other stuff. Um, I'll probably be streaming games on Sunday during the subathon. It'll be my last stream for a while. Um, but it'll be fun. Thank you, Joa. I'm probably going to make a lot of those into YouTube videos, so expect whenever I get the editing done. My goal would be to get the editing done for all of those before I leave for vacation, and then I can uh, I can space everything out so that you guys, I can post like a video a week to the channel while I'm gone. You going to play Strive in the subathon? Um, probably. Uh, I have to figure out what I want to play. I don't know. We'll see what I'm doing. All right. See you guys. Thanks for hanging out. Love you all. Bye. Ta-da-la. Have a good night.